Hi, and welcome to History Makers TV. I'm Matt Prater. Today we're speaking with Ian Watto Watson from Shed Happens, and his mate Lars Hall is joining us. Welcome to the show, Lars. How you doing, mate? Thank you, Matt. Now tell us a bit, a bit of your story. Where, where are you at in life these days? Well, uh, midlife. Yes. I think it's the definition. <laughs> and obviously, uh, been here 17 years in this beautiful country. Mm -hmm. so, so, in this beautiful country, been here 17 years. Where from? I was born in Denmark. Denmark. What's the most beautiful memory of Denmark? I'll just have to state one detail. Denmark is not a town in Holland. It is a country of its own. And the most beautiful memory of Denmark is probably where I grew up, a little country town called Awaranlu, of all places. Could you say that again, please? <laughs> Awaranlu. Okay. Could you now tell the viewers <clears throat> your name? My name is Lars Ole Skogsbo Hell. Oh, isn't that beautiful? It's like music. Well, it's not really when you come to Australia and you try to pronounce your name over the phone and people go, huh? <laughs> Lars, how come you're in Australia? How come? Um, my dad, he warned me about flying light aircraft when I got here the first time. And uh, he never mentioned anything about the blonde in the back seat. So ah. I met my wife when I was 19 years old. Came out to do some jackarooing and uh, flying from the outback into Sydney in this little Cessna. That's where I met my wife. How many in the plane? There was four, two guys in the front and uh, me and uh, my woman in the back seat. <laughs> Come on, roll this love affair on a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that was really complicated because I was actually flying to Sydney. I got a lift down there with the boys. They were getting their license to fly at night and I needed to go to Sydney to book my ticket to go back to Denmark. I'd been here for a year and a half as part of my uh, ag education. And I met her, I had a, she had a girlfriend coming to pick her up at Bankstown and I thought, great, I can get a lift, I need to go to the city. So I got myself a lift, invited her out for lunch, awesome. Anyway, as it rolled on, it turned into a love affair. And uh, unfortunately for me, we only managed to spend 10 days together before I had to leave the country. But you knew then that she was your woman? Yes, I did. And she knew you were her man? I'm not so sure. Ah. But I made sure to invite her to come to Denmark to see where I was from. Roll this love affair a little. Uh, right, yeah. So she came in February. Interesting part about Denmark in February is uh, negative uh, Celsius degrees and snow. And uh, there was no internet and no phones. and my, Well, there was phone, but nobody could afford to use them. So. Everything was done with an aerogram, so I actually wrote letters to my lovely filly down here. And she came, somebody in the plane sat next to her and said, are, are you sure he's going to meet you at the airport? Lo and behold, on the day she lands in Copenhagen, which is on an island near Sweden, basically I got stuck in a snowstorm, uh, which as in this country is a joke, but it's only 22 minutes by, by plane but I was physically snowed in on the runway. So she sat in the airport for nearly three hours before I got there. And this couple she'd seen on the plane, they said, oh, we thought that might be a problem. But lucky for me, I did turn up. And then we couldn't fly back. We had to take the train back because <laughs> the airport was shut down. So you married this girl, where'd you marry? And uh, how did that happen? <laughs> how come you now back in Australia? Look. We married three years later. She was doing her nursing in this country and um, I was doing, uh, I had to finish my ag degree in Denmark. So the practicalities were we had to stay um, a remote sort of distance for three years. Then she came to Denmark, the practicalities again. Uh, she had a sister in London at the time. So that was a great opportunity to come across to Europe. Uh, we had to get married pretty much instantly due to the fact that she wasn't from an EU country. So visa regulations, she would only be allowed to stay for three months and then get kicked out. So we had to go to the police and get interviewed and find out if she was a genuine and if it was a genuine relationship. That was interesting, but that worked out. Now, son of who? Lars, you are son of who? Son of Henning Emanuel Hell. <laughs> and my mum is Margit Irene Hell. And I guess that brings me back to being a Viking. So we're pretty much purebred Danes. Mm. Now, God, I asked you your father's name. Yep. What's your connection there with God? Uh, my dad was a minister of religion, uh, retired now. But 
that was the journey. He was a Methodist uh, minister when, when I was born and he transferred to the Danish uh, Lutheran State Church. So how was that with the son of a pastor? How was it? Um, the little country town I grew up in, it was fantastic because I was on a farm. So the manse was a physical farm. So I basically grew up on, on farms and in a little village with the local farmers. So I grew up amongst the men on the farms. Good relationship with your dad? Uh, not much of a relationship really. He was the academic. He was, this is hard to picture, but I grew up in a really, really big house. I, imagine a house that's 68 meters long. And my dad's office was up the far end and the living end was sort of down the other end. So I didn't see him. Don't go anywhere. There's another amazing guest coming up soon on History Makers TV. Okay, so your wife, you have children. Yep. How come, who makes the move to Australia? What are the circumstances? Um, we got married and started out with obviously nothing, as a lot of young couples do. Uh, we had to get her up to speed with the language, which is a difficult language to learn when, from a foreign perspective. And obviously she had to get her nursing license to practice her nursing in Denmark. So we had an interesting journey there. We had both our children uh, were born in Denmark. We ended up in a town. So when you're in Brisbane, if you look at Toowoomba, that would probably be a similar size. So we came from the Brisbane area and moved to Toowoomba for this particular education. And we were there for a while and I worked my way up through the ranks in a business and ended up in the IT industry, selling and buying computer consumables. And I worked my way up uh, from the warehouse to become the logistics and purchasing manager. And it was a fantastic challenge. We grew the business 200%. Unfortunately for us, our biggest dealer or distributor in Copenhagen went belly up. And we were at a size we couldn't afford to let him go, belly up, so we took over that business. That inflicted on me in the way that I had to be in Copenhagen every Thursday. Which so what's that do to a marriage? It becomes, you know, pretty much FIFO. And the last year was harrowing because I was there every Thursday. Plus, I had all my other responsibilities all over Europe. So when you catch up with your neighbour and he said, where were you today? And I said, oh, I was in London. He looks at you and goes, are you kidding? No, I got up at three o'clock this morning and I got home again at five o'clock this afternoon. So a defining moment in manhood comes upon you now? It did because my wife, she worked uh, evening duties and basically we, we had everything money could buy. You know, I finally got now, I had arrived, I thought I was a success. And she told me that she was desperately lonely. She loved me, but she was taking the kids and she was moving to Australia. And then she pulled out my calendar and she showed me in the space of seven months, I had 80 travel days, so 80 nights I wasn't home. So you were more married to the job. That's okay, right. let's fast forward into Australian life. What's yep. it like with a, a Dane with how many, um, English words in your vocabulary. How did you find the Australian <coughs> culture, especially of manhood? Rip into that, thanks Lars. It really surprised me when I got here because I'd been here when I was 18, 19 and I thought I had the language down pat. I turned up again at 35 and, and in business and obviously with responsibilities and, and language is a challenge because the first job I got was in sales. And I speak English with a Danish accent, if you like, and the guy on the other end, he might be from Korea or China or from somewhere else, and his accent was even harder for me to understand. So I really knocked my self-confidence. And I guess when you learn a language coming from abroad, you come probably with about 20,000 words, whereas if you were born here, you would have about 80,000 words in your vocabulary. So that was interesting to adjust to that. And then the way business was done here, um, people lay it, it was very different. The, the first day of the office, um, a lady, she was sitting on the phone and she's swearing her head off in an open office environment. The office I came out of, you would have been sacked on the spot. Mm. But no, she was dealing with the Australian Navy and they liked talking to her because she was, you know, rough as guts. Okay, 74 flood, momentous moment for you for communication. Did you actually unpack your bags then? Sorry, the 74 floods. Well, you, you, lost me. you helped with the Red Cross then, Oh, didn't that, you? 2010. 2010, was it? Yes. Okay. I so got a job where I've got a blue card, so I'm, I'm able to work with people uh, and kids, if you like, so I'm safe. So the Red Cross, they put a field out and said, could we volunteer? And I got sent to the Mount Gravatt Evacuation Centre, which was the stadium. And I met a 
bunch of people that came out of the suburb of Rockley and you saw the devastation, you saw these people that just lost everything in the space of a day. And that just made an, a massive impression on me. One guy, he went back the following day, borrowed someone's tinny, and he sailed over the top of his house. And then he came back to the evacuation centre and just sat down quietly with a couple of guys and he said, I sailed across the top of my house. And I know it was my house because the flagpole was still there. And then he laughed and he said, and I could clean the gutter with the propeller of the outboard. It, only, an Aussie, only an Aussie could say that. You, total devastation. And yet the following week, the mud army came and I just saw the Aussies in full flight. And how can you not fall in love with a country that does that? Good as gold. So dinky die Aussie now. Dinky die Aussie family. What about Lars and God? What goes on with you now? Is he for real for you? He definitely is. Uh, he had to make life difficult for me to understand there was other things in life than money. So obviously um, I've had a turnaround in that space. You got a little moment there when it became a reality to a, such a big strong man <clears> like you? Yeah, I think that moment of reality when your pride gets stripped off you and when your pride is tied up in your adventures in business and the finances and the deals you do and suddenly all that is taken away and next minute you're fighting for survival. That, that was a very educational journey. And on that journey, that's where you came into the picture with the shed knife. And so what's shed been to you? Well, that's or what it is today. What's it really mean? It, it has been an absolute godsend, I think is the right word. And simply for the networking and the connection and the genuine people. Because you, you really cut all the, the BS and you go straight to the core of what it is. And that was interesting to be faced with the fact that, hang on, stand up in front of a hundred blokes and just be honest. So what about your woman now, this woman that was the blonde in the back of the plane? Uh, who, do you, who are you to her now? Well, you know, have you who am really I? Have you stood up to be the real man of God for her? What's that mean to you now? Yeah, that was another learning curve, the head of the house. What does that really mean? And I had to stand up and learn that because that was not something that felt natural to me. It was not part of my cultural background, if you like. So that has been a journey, and especially the last year here, we've done some church hopping, and I ended up making a choice and uh, found a church, and that's our home, and that's our base. And my wife, she follows me there. <laughs> wow, eh? Good. <laughs> Definitely. And what about, just finally, what about your, your children? Just what's it like to be a father of a, your daughter and your son, just, just <clears> to finish it off? Any father that's got daughters, they would know that it's a challenge. It's one you have to rise to, and as they go through teenage years, you're being educated. But I am lucky, you know, she is an amazing young woman today, and she is absolutely out there, and she's fighting for God, and she's fighting for love, and she's got a passion for what she's doing. Mm -hmm. My son, he is just finishing, um, he's uh, becoming a high school teacher, so he's doing prac at the moment, and again, you know, he's got a real passion for God, and for young people, and his sport, so we are very much blessed with a couple of young kids that are touring the world. And Lars, you're an amazing connector of people, especially men. What's your little moment that you would like to spread about for Australian men to know about connection, the value of the heart connection? There probably really is only one thing. As a foreigner that I came here, the one thing I lost was my network, and that was horrific. And the challenge was to find someone you can trust. The men's shed, everybody is there in a safe environment. It's a different space to meet up in. And that was fantastic. So, and, and then look at every stranger is a potential new friend. Mm. I love that part. Matt, so Matt, here we have Lars Hall, a man who's traveled across the sea to win the heart of an Aussie girl a true champion, Lars Hall, a, hist a true history maker. Good on you, mate. Thank you so much, Lars, for joining us. You are a history maker. You are on History Makers TV. We'll have more coming up soon. Look, how many of you guys, how many of you guys have ever like, listen, man, do you guys believe that Jesus is real? Do you believe that? Come on. I want you guys, you do me a favor, bro. I listen. I don't, it don't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter where you're at. Would you be willing to pray with me right now? 
for God to have your life completely and for him to possess your life, who would say that they would do that right now? That's right, it's Jesus, man. It's got to be Jesus, man. Come on, who else? Who all would do it, man, to say yes to Jesus, man, for real? Come on, man. Awesome. Come on. Let's do it. Everybody come in the huddle. Whoever wants to pray with us, I want you guys to come in right now. Come on, man. This is awesome. I'm serious, dude. Have you guys ever given your life to Jesus? Have you ever? I have a crucifix on my back. Come here. Come on up here. Come on. Fieldy, this is so good. Listen, we're going to ask God right now to come and make his home inside. I'm not, I'm, I'm, this sounds funny, but I promise you, it changes everything. If you've never given your life to Jesus, come up.